Well, I remember my freshman year of college, I expressed my affections to a young girl. I told her that I was interested in her romantically and that I wanted to date. And so a few weeks later, we met down at the beach. And I remember while we were down there with this big group, we decided to jump on this hayride, this horse-drawn chariot on the beach. And so we joined the hayride. It was me and her, and then sitting next to her was this other guy that apparently she had been talking to and hanging out with for several days. And so as the three of us rode down the beach together, <laughs> she began to tell me stories about him and how he had recently cooked a meal for her, and it was, quote, the most romantic thing a guy had ever done for her. And I remember as she said that, suddenly the horse ran over some driftwood on the beach, and it shattered the axle of the carriage, and everyone came cumbling down. There was hay everywhere. And I realized, you know what? This feels like a great time to exit this scene. <laughs> And so I left, good luck, and I walked down the beach alone in the moonlight. And I remember as I did that, I was like, this isn't just a good time to exit this scene. Maybe it's a good time to exit the dating scene altogether and to give up on love. <laughs> but I didn't do it. And that following year, I had to break up with a girl and cry, even though I didn't realize we were actually dating. And then the following year, I remember there was a night where a girl and I broke up and then had our first kiss on the same night in that order. <laughs> and you say, Ben, that doesn't make any sense. And I say, I know, I know. I remember one girl telling me once, uh, Ben, you should, really, you should really get counseling. And I said, you know, you're, you're probably right. Uh, that's probably true. So all through college, my dating life was chaos. So I just realized I can't handle it. Something's wrong. I just kind of light them all on fire. So I just got to stop. And for six years, I took a hiatus from dating. And then six years later, there was a lot of maturity in my own life, some growth. And then I remember I met Donna and it was an entirely different experience of getting to know one another. And I would say we really did it right. And then I remember there was a night where I was sitting in the library getting my master's. I was supposed to be studying for finals. I had all my books open, but all I was doing was looking at cut and clarity and carrots of rings because I realized I'm done with singleness. I'm done with dating. I'm ready to check out, buy a ring, and get married to this girl. I want her. Right? Now, why mention all that? I say all that because I want you to know that I understand dating is difficult. Dating is risky. I mean, one date, if it goes bad, you survive it, makes a funny story later. But if you start to journey with somebody three, four dates and, and share more of your heart and then break up, it, it can really hurt. Dating's a risky thing. And so some of us look at it and you go, why would I do that? It's like grabbing hands and skipping through a minefield. Let's try this. It just feels like <laughs> it's going to go bad. Why would I even do it? And then yet you show up at a friend's wedding and you see love in blossom and you go, but I want that. How do I get from here to there? A very natural, Norman, normal human process has really picked up a lot of complexity. How do we journey from singleness through dating into the gift God's given us called marriage? That's what we're talking about. And specifically, as we've been journeying together, we talked about how singleness is about devotion. God has ordained singleness for every human being to secure an undistracted devotion to him, is what Paul told the Corinthians, that we were single to get the first thing first, to get that right, the main thing, the main thing, that I know God. And then as I'm chasing him, I start to meet people that, hey, could be potential people I grip hands and run with into the rest of life. And that's what dating is. It's evaluating this person? Are we meant to run together? And now today we're talking about engagement. And engagement, there's much you could say. If dating is about evaluation, engagement is about union, the merging of two lives. It's the merging of our finances. It's the merging of our families. Uh, it's the merging of our futures. We will now be running together into the unknown. And there's much you could say about it. And it's a tender thing. It's like bringing a boat up next to a dock. There's a way you can do it that's smooth and barely causes a ripple in the water. There's a way to do it that goes crashing into the dock and sends wood and fiberglass and humans everywhere. And so how do we dock into each other's lives well? And here's the thing, I can make this a premarital class and talk about how to get engaged, and that could be great, but I want to back it up and talk about that very dangerous, tenuous, confusing place of how do you know that you know that this person I'm interested in is the one I want to marry? How do you go from evaluating 
to union. How do you know that you know that you've met the one? That's where we're going today. Does that make sense? And we're going to do it by looking at the book Song of Solomon. It's one of the most beautiful books in the Bible. And I love it. And I wish we could teach the whole thing. I don't have time. We'll just kind of grab selections, but I want to teach it. Maybe in a year. We'll give ourselves a break and then we'll swing back around to it because I love it because it doesn't just warn you about all the dangers of dating and lust. Rather, it shows you the beauty of it done right. And you read this poetry that's either by or about King Solomon as he talks about the courting and marriage and love with his beloved Shulamite. It's a beautiful book that extols the beauties of love and unashamedly and almost embarrassingly celebrates sex, right? It's a beautiful book. And so I want to back us up to early in the book, they kind of have some memories of what it was like when they met and fell in love and journeyed to marriage. And I want to look at that and see what are some things that we should feel and we should see in a relationship that give us confidence that this is the right person. What are some things we should feel? What are some things that we should see that gives us confidence that this is the one I'm meant to run with for a lifetime? That's where we're going. Make sense? Everybody on board? Whether you are or not, here we go. All right. Number one, how do you know you're ready to marry someone? How do you know? An indicator, an initial one, is that you feel excitement. And that's where we are at the beginning of Song of Solomon. They feel legitimately excited. The lover's excitement about one another leaps from the page. The very first book, words. As the woman speaks, she says, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. She sees this guy and she's like, I want our faces to mash. I want my face as close to his face as possible. I want to be near this guy. She is unashamedly infatuated in the inspired word of God. Is it wrong to be excited about somebody? No, it's from God that we would get that excitement about each other. She says later, she declares your love is better than wine. Wine in the Middle East, it was the drink of celebration. It was, it was the most delightful thing you could put up to your lips. It would make you feel warm inside and lightheaded. And she said, that's how he makes me feel when I'm around him. He's delightful and I'm warm and I'm a little crazy. That's how I feel when I'm around him. Which brings a natural question. Guys, what has he done to get her so dialed up? Some of you are reading that and you're like, yeah, I need to know what makes her feel that way. And she says in the next verse, she says, your anointing oils are fragrant. Now, that could mean that his cologne game was strong. You know, because back then in the Middle East, it was very hot. People get sweaty and there weren't a lot of showers. And so men would wear aromatic oils. And maybe she's just saying that. You smell fantastic. And that's probably true. Guys, bathe would be a note you could make. But as you keep reading, something deeper is going on. She says, your name is like oil poured out. And, and that's such a brilliant line of poetry because she says, your name is like oil poured out. That scent is our sense most tied to memory. And when you smell something, you instantly react. If it smells wonderful, what happens? You lean in, breathe in, mmm, right? <laughs> if it smells horrible, you recoil. You even crimp up your nose to just try to protect your nostrils like, ugh, Right? You do that with a nice smell or a bad smell. You also do it when you remember somebody's name. If I say a name to you, we respond to somebody's name. If I say a name like Hitler, you go, Ugh. And you may not even be thinking about a particular speech. What are you thinking about? That name brings to mind what? His character, his reputation. The accumulated effect of his decisions you respond to just by hearing his name. When you hear that name, you recoil. Or if I say a name like Abraham Lincoln, you go, oh, right? Like, okay, I respond positively to that name because I think of some character attributes, the kind of person he was. Your name is your reputation. Your name is your character. When your name is spoken, it calls thoughts to people's mind and they respond. How do they respond when they hear your name? Do they think of a trustworthy person, a reliable one, a caring one? She says, your name is like oil poured out. When people hear your name, they go, hmm, that's a good man. That man cares about people. That man has integrity. He says what he means, and he does what he says. That guy is right. He is good. Do they do that with you? Proverbs 22 says, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed better than silver or gold. Marry character. Let character be what turns you on. Because looks fade 
And ladies, guys, their ears will continue to grow. Their rears will shrivel up. It, the looks will fade. But is he a good listener? Is he kind to you when you're having a difficult day? Let me tell you something. When you put on that ring, that will not change his character. Watch him now. See what he's like with other people. Is his name like oil poured out? Does he have a wonderful reputation? Let that be what excites you. But what's great is it's not character alone that excites her. There's something else. And you see it in that next chapter as the man gets excited. And the Shulamite declares, the voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks to me, arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. How do you know this is someone you should marry? There's excitement. She's excited. These staccato presentations of statements let you know she's excited. She's like, behold, he comes. He's like a gazelle. He is swift. He's like a stag. He radiates masculinity. And he's excited too. He's not walking to her house. He's leaping. He's bounding. When he arrives there, he's not like, whatever, honking the horn. He is peering through the lattice. He's overcoming obstacles, leaping over mountains. Nothing will keep me from my beloved. He's peering through the lattice, even for a glimpse of his beloved. He's excited. Why is he so excited? He says in verse 10, arise, my love, my beautiful one. Is he excited that she's physically attractive? Yes, he calls her my beautiful one. That matters that he's physically attracted to her. But nine times in this very short book, and right here he calls her my love. That word, my love, in Hebrew is the word rayati. It's, it's translated neighbor, companion, friend, friend. The reason why he's so excited about seeing her is not just that she has character, but there's kindness. They're friends. She responds to him and calls him beloved all through the book. It's the Hebrew word dodi, dodi. It's someone that I cherish. What's happening is they enjoy being around each other. I like being near you. I trust you and you're kind to me. That's what excites them, character and kindness. And you need to see that in a relationship. Do you like being around each other. That seems like such a no-brainer to say that. And yet I talk to couples all the time that start talking about marriage just because they've been dating so long they figured they might as well. And you're like, but you're not happy. I remember in college living with some guys and they were like, well, both of them were like, well, we're going to marry people. But she would constantly put him down. They would constantly criticize each other and bicker. I'm like, neither of you are happy. Why, why would you stack till death do us part on the bar when you can't get along for an evening? I mean, you need to watch and say, do I like being around this person? Do I enjoy their company? Do I miss them when they're gone, or is it a relief? When we go to dinner together, am I constantly checking my phone or where the exits are? <laughs> or does time seem to fly by? You need to enjoy being around them. This couple's had time to do that, and what they feel is excitement. But it's not just about enjoying their company. It's also about being improved by their company. And that's the next point that you should see life. So listen to what the beloved says. It says, my beloved speaks to me and says, arise my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land, the fig tree ripens its figs, the vines are in blossom, they give forth fragrance, arise my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Ladies, what time of year is he describing? Springtime, it's the time of life. That when I'm around you, I'm not just excited by you physically. Being around you is this explosion of life. That us being together, we don't just enjoy it, it's improving us. That when you see a couple come together, you need to see not just that they like hanging out, but are they better people as a result of that union? It's interesting. I remember there was a song back when I was a kid by Tiffany. It was a romantic song, apparently. She would say, so we're running just as fast as we can, holding on to one another's hand, trying to get away into the night, and then you put your arms around me, and we tumble to the ground, and then you say, I think we're alone now. And I remember listening to that song, and I'm like, so you're both running, and he tackles you? Like he tackles you, like you're running, you're like, ugh, ugh, ah, ah, and you hit the ground, you're like, I get you're trying to be romantic, but that's so odd. But let me tell you something, I see that in relationships all the time. 
that I'll meet a young man that he's pursuing the things of God and learning. I'll meet a young girl that wants to please the Lord and be like him in the world and they'll meet each other. And as soon as they meet each other, they get infatuated, wrap up and they hit the ground and their pursuit of God derails. And suddenly you see them not showing up in church as much anymore. You see them not coming to small groups. You see a a guilt and a shame over their violations and compromise of their character begin to steal their joy. You see stress enter in because their communication is so poor. And you watch the lights go out in their eyes that one plus one equals zero. This isn't an improvement being around this person. And you need to watch that. Am I better as, as a result of being around them? Are they challenging me spiritually? Do I watch their growth with God and say, I want that too? Do I watch their character and say, I want to match that too? Do I watch their zeal for life and say, I want to match that stride for stride? Are they making me a better person? You want to see that. And let me tell you something. For some of this, this may be a timing issue. For me, all my dating life in college went terrible. And it wasn't the girl's fault. I realized after a while, if all these are a dumpster fire, maybe the problem is me. (laughs) And I realized I can't build a we if I don't have me figured out. And so I had to work on myself and go, you know what? The right person at the wrong time is the wrong person. And these girls were great and nice, but trying to get together, the communication was confusing. We were forcing things. And I just realized I wasn't ready. And it was, I had to get some things figured out. And I realized when we grip hands and run together, we get worse, not better. And the reality is if you're going to run with someone forever, you want to see them improving you as a person that you're challenged by the way they pursue the Lord. It doesn't look just like the way you do, but it enhances you as a person. I am a better person as a result of being around Donna. I had some strong gifts before I met her, but I had some serious weaknesses. She has taught me so much about being nice and kind with my face, right? (laughs) Apparently, I present very cold, and I'm working on it. I'm a better person as a result of being around her. Are you better as a result of being in that person? person's presence. So that's what they feel. And incidentally, your community should see that too. They should see the excitement, but they should see the life. That's why they say, rightly, do the virgins love you. This is the right person for you to feel that way about. There's excitement and there is life. We are better as a result of each other's presence. Now, what are some things you should see about the relationship? The first one, I think, to let you know that you know this is the right person to marry, what you should see in the relationship is a strong internal sense of commitment. Do I see in myself and this other person a resolve to work through conflict even when it's hard? Do we want to stay? You see it later in the book of Song of Solomon, chapter eight. The beloved says, set me as a seal upon your arm, or upon your heart and as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy as fierce as the grave. It flashes our flashes of fire, the very flames of the Lord. How is love like death? When death grabs a hold of someone, it does not let go, right? It stays. And she said, love is like that. Love, when it grabs someone, it commits. How do you know you really love someone? You say, I find that I want to stay in sickness and health for better or for worse. I discover in myself a resolve to stay even when it's hard. And what I'm saying there is not that you can grit and bear it. I imagine many of you have great resolve in your hearts and you could be like, I will marry this person. And you're like, while you're dating, you don't have to do that, right? And I'm not saying, do you have the resolve to do it? And I'm also not saying, do you like being around that person and would miss them when they're gone? I'm saying when y'all disagree, when a character flaw comes up that you realize isn't going to change, are you suddenly kind of checking the locks on the door and wanting to get out? Are you saying, no, I want to work through this? See, it was interesting. I was the last one of my friends to get married. Every single one of my groomsmen was a married man. So I got a lot of advice uh, when I was dating and getting married. And every single one of them, when I asked them that question, how did you know that you knew this was the right girl? They all said, you just know which as many of you know, is colossally unhelpful. (laughs) And so I pressed one of them. No, I don't believe that. Tell me why you know. And he was like, I don't know, you just know. I'm like, how do you know? He said, there was an ease to it. I said, what does that mean? Does that mean that you never argued? And he said, no, we definitely argued. I said, then what was the difference between other relationships? And I remember this buddy was very insightful. He thought about it for a while and he said, you know what, Ben? He said, in other relationships, whenever we'd hit a friction, 
some personality trait that graded on each other, some big disagreement about direction in life. He said, whenever we hit those, there was always something in me that was like, I just, I kind of knew this wasn't right. I was kind of feeling like we're forcing this. I kind of, I don't, I don't know that I want to fight for this. He said, I felt that every time. He said, but with her, whenever we conflicted, I realized in myself, hey, I want to work through this. Hey, I want to get to the other side of this together. I want to work through conflict to deeper unity together. Whatever this obstacle is, let's get over it together. He said, and then I saw in her that same resolve, that if one person has that resolve and the other doesn't, it's not going to work. He said, I saw in both of us internally, I want to make this work. I want to make this work good. Then I'm not just fighting for victory in an argument. I'm fighting for victory for us in the argument, that we grip hands and move through conflict into deeper unity. I saw a resolve within us. I saw a love that overcomes truth trials and can withstand temptations. And that's the kind of love you need. That's how they pick Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs, when you want to go into it, you go through buds, this grueling process uh, where they winnow out who's going to really be a SEAL and who's not. And as men go in to try to be SEALs, 100% of them are tested and physically can handle the demands of buds. And yet there's a 75% dropout rate. Why? Because they get these guys in there and they dunk them in icy cold water again and again and again. And then they throw them in the icy ocean, pull them out, make them roll around in the sand and get crusty from head to toe and then run down the beach and then run back and dive in icy water. And then they make them do that whole thing again and again and again. And while they're doing that, what are they testing? Resolve. They're testing that some guys go, you know, I like the idea of being a seal, but cold water's lame. And this job involves a lot of cold water, and I don't like sand in my shorts, and this job has a lot of sand, and, you know, maybe I like the idea of being tough, but I don't really like this job. And meanwhile, while they're doing that, constantly instructors are offering them a blanket, a towel, a Snickers bar. All you got to do is say yes to that. Walk over and ring this little bell, and you're gone. And they constantly put in front of them trials and temptations, pressure to make you go, I don't want it, it's not worth it. And then allurements to say, I would rather go there. And some guys ring the bell and say, I don't want it. Other guys say, you know what, I want it and keep bringing it. I will not stay away. Love is stronger than death and jealousy fiercer than the grave. And they realize we're going to kill these guys. We'd better stop. Let's make them seals. That's how it works. (laughs) And love is the same way. Song of Solomon says it this way, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. How do you know real love? It withstands temptation. It withstands trials. When we have difficulty in trials, I will overcome them. When we disagree, we work through it. When we come to major issues, we talk about it and resolve it, that we withstand trials. And then it says, if a man is offered for love all the wealth of this house, he would be utterly despised. He says, no trial will overcome it. No temptation will seduce it. That's how you know. So when you're dating someone, that's why you evaluate. Just watch them. When y'all begin to disagree, do they suddenly stop calling, stop texting? That's useful information. Maybe that's not the guy. Let an old girlfriend come back to town. Let someone you always thought was cute suddenly take interest in you. And just watch. See what happens. If they start working something on the side, good information in the evaluating. This isn't the person I want to link up with forever. How do you know true love? No trial can shake it. No temptation can allure it. Get away from me. Back away. We have true love. You think this happens every day? That's how you know you got it. That you sense within yourself and the other person a resolve to commit even when it's hard. When you get married, you will stand on a stage in front of God and everyone and declare, I promise to love you in sickness and health until death do us part in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You will take the name of the Trinity. And let me tell you something. You don't want to make a statement like that and hope it's true. You want those words to be the exact reflection of what you already know is in your heart. You want to look them in the face and mean it under God. So you need to see within yourself while you're dating a a commitment, a resolve to stay even when it's hard. But you don't just need a resolve to commit. You need a growing skill of communication. That's the next thing. You need the skill of communication. You need to know how to talk. You need to know how to resolve when things are hard. You can be infatuated with one another, but if you disagree, if one of you yells, that has harsh words that are like thrusts of a sword, Proverbs says, that's a dangerous person to live with. Or if you have someone that freezes you out, 
And you're constantly having to guess, why are you mad? What's going on? Oh, my God. And they make you guess what's wrong with them. That's not healthy. That's cancer. You need someone that says, hey, I have a resolve for commitment, for unity, and we've grown skill of how to talk to each other to work this thing out. It's interesting. You watch this couple disagree. You see later in their marriage that he comes to her and he's calling her my darling, my love, my beautiful one. And you go, what's he into today, right? And he sort of shows up late at night and she says, basically, I'm not in the mood. I got a headache. I'm tired. <laughs> and so he leaves the room. And you see her get concerned that he's mad. And so she goes to the door. And in the beautiful poetry of the book, she says, My beloved put his hand to the latch. My heart was thrilled within me. I arose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. When she refused him and rebuffed him, he did not come back in anger, but he left blessing behind one of the most expensive perfumes and fragrances you could put down there. Even in the midst of disagreement, there's a sweetness and a kindness with him towards her, that they have a way to communicate that moves you towards unity, not away from it. Harsh words are like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness breaks the spirit. You want someone that the way they use their mouth is a tree of life. And I would just say, we don't have a time to do a whole talk on communication. I would say when you disagree with someone, and this works everywhere in life, by the way, you want to focus on their actions and how you feel. The only two things you can really know. Their actions and how you feel. You don't know their motives, so don't do that. And that's what I see many couples do. You're trying to make me look stupid. You're trying to make me look bad. You're trying to embarrass me. You're ascribing motive to that person. You don't know that. What you need to focus on is, hey, when you did that thing, it made me feel this way. When you made fun of me in front of that group, it made me feel like you will ditch me for the approval of the crowd. And that makes me not want to trust you. And I don't like that. You need to be able to say, when you did that, this is how I feel. You need to figure out how to communicate. And in dating, you don't really know each other very well. But as you progress through dating and you get closer, you will hit these moments where you realize we disagree. And if we don't have the skill of communication, we won't make it. I remember for Donna and I, early on, when we got into that moment where it was time to meet the families, this was an important moment. And I remember for me, I brought her to meet my Italian relatives in San Antonio, Texas. And I understood that my Italian family, when you come to bring them, that's a very big deal. And for them, love is about quantity time. So when you go to visit the family, that's three, four days, right? And uh, the way it works is you hang out and you have a meal and then you hang out some more and you talk and then you move around rooms and hang out with different ones. And then when it's about a day before it's time to go, you go, well, I better get going. And that launches a bunch of conversations they meant to have. And then you move to a room that's closer to the door and more conversations ensue. And then you move to another room and more ensue. And then you get out into the car and they physically hold onto the car and grandpa would pop the hood and start changing things. And you're like, grandpa, please stop. Oh, okay. And then they're jacking up the car and you're still talking and one of them's gripping the window and slowly over the course of several days, you make your way out of the house. And so I remember when I showed up, that's normal. So I brought Donna and an hour in to dinner, she's texting her brother. And I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm making plans with my brother for later tonight because he lives in town. And for me, all that communicated was, you hate my family. I brought you here to show you off and you can't get out of here fast enough. And I thought, really? You're going to bet you haven't even been here two hours. You're trying to hurry up out the door? And for me, that was entirely about, what's, what's your problem? You got an attitude problem, and I don't really like it. Because these people, these are my family. We're going to be together forever. And if you can't be, be, stand to be around them, how can I be knit together with you? This all feels bad. It was a difficult thing. Until I remember we did a holiday with her family, and we did Thanksgiving at her grandma's house. And I remember we showed up there. Thanksgiving dinner was out. We all came in, ate dinner together. About an hour into the meal, grandma stood up and said, all right, everyone, thanks for coming. We're like, what? And then she showed everyone to the door and ushered us out. I'm like, wait a minute, it's only day one. What is happening? And I realized <laughs> that's it for them. Thanksgiving is a meal. Meal has been consumed. See you next year. And I realized... If I would have just focused on her motive, you hate my family. You don't like them. You're a bad person. You don't care about people. The relationship would have broke. But rather, I said, when you called your brother, that made me feel like you don't want to be around my family. And she was like, no, that, what? I love your family. I just thought we had dinner with them. We'd catch up with my brother later. And I'm like, no, no, love equals five days, like five, <laughs> four maybe. But I realized it wasn't a moral issue, right or wrong. It was just different. 
But if we had bad communication, we wouldn't have made it. And some of you, you have someone you're infatuated with, but y'all haven't figured out the skill of communication. And you are thrusting swords at one another with your words, and your relationship will not flourish. Or you freeze each other out in a really unhealthy way of dealing with one another. You can't do that. We have to speak in a way that gives life. And that means discovering things about yourself. I know for me, I realized I had a real sensitivity to being made fun of in public uh, by my wife. Because for me, I'm like, no one's tighter than this circle. So when you diminish me in front of other people, it's not even an ego thing. It just makes me realize you would ditch me for other people. And I I don't know that I like that. I'm like, let's let's always speak well of each other to other people. And if we have a conflict, let's talk about it later. But, but, But don't try to embarrass me for the name of a joke. And I didn't realize that was a thing with me. But I had to discover that myself. But if we hadn't developed the skill of communication, we wouldn't have made it past that barrier. That's something you need to see. Can we talk in a way that creates not just victory in the argument, but unity in the relationship? You need to get that right. The next thing I would say is you need to survive a moment of confession. Survive a moment of confession. What I read in chapter 2 was an interesting moment in the courtship of this couple. What you saw was an initial excitement They're getting to know each other. They've become friends. She calls him Haloop, my best friend. And yet as they get closer, we get to this moment where he says something very particular to her. He says, oh, my dove, in the cleft of the rock, in the crannies of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your face or your form is lovely. Guys, what position is she in? He presents her as way up and far away in the crannies of a rock. And he pictures her as a dove, a beautiful but tender and fragile creature. So what does he do? I will scale up and grab my dove? No, what does he do? He calls to her and invites her, show me more of you, come towards me. His way of leaning towards her is with his words, and he invites, he initiates, he compliments, He shares his heart. I want to be with you. I want to be near you. But then he lets her respond. He's asking her to show more of herself. And that's a delicate thing. And that's really what dating and engagement becomes. Intimacy requires vulnerability. To really be known means I really need to share myself. Not just the best parts that you put forward on date one. Well, I'm a go-getter and I never stop and I love adventure and I love travel. And okay, after all that's done, let me really get to know what makes you tick. And as I get more vulnerable, there's a propensity for more intimacy and a propensity for more damage. It's a dangerous place. And so what I tell people is, hey, if you don't feel like you're financially or emotionally ready to get married in the next six months, don't go calling doves out of the rock and trying to grab hold of her emotionally. That's a, that's a dangerous and cruel thing to do to people. Men can really harm women. Physically, we know that. Much of the damage physically done to women in our country is by men they know. Men can be dangerous with their strength, or they can be loving with it. They can be kind and tender with it. There's a sensitivity to women. Peter will call them the weaker vessel. And by that, he doesn't mean constitutionally you can't handle the pressure. He's talking about something like porcelain. It doesn't mean it's less valuable than men. It means it's more so. I don't use my iPad to dig a trench, right? That that it's even more valuable than my shovel. And Peter says, a woman is a valuable, precious thing. You be tender with your strength, men. You be gentle. And as you're getting to know someone, you decide, am I ready to begin to interact with her emotionally? Then let me call the dove out. And as you do that, let me say, what that means is you will risk vulnerability. And I would say in that risk of vulnerability, you have to share all that you were before. And I think there's a moment And I don't think it's drawn out over months and weeks and years. I think there's a moment, maybe one big conversation, maybe a couple after, where you say, hey, before we progress to the next level, I need to tell you who I used to be. And you need to share with them a lot about your story, the depths of who you are. Because here's the thing. She can take an imperfect man, but she can't take a liar. She needs to know you. And I know some of us hear this, men and women, and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. My past is my business. That's my story. They don't need to know that. I get to control that. But let me tell you something. Why do you want to be married? It's because you want to be fully known. You want someone to know you down to the depths and love you fully anyway. That's the beautiful thing she says later. My, I am my beloved's and he is mine. 
She said, I am his. He owns me, and I am, he is mine. I own, we love and are knit together in the tightest way. You don't want to constantly have to redact stories about your past with the person closest to you. They need to know all of you. Now, let me say, don't do that on the first date. And don't do it on subsequent dates. But as you get approaching, you need to say, hey, here are some things that you need to know about me that I'm not real proud of. And some of you go, why would I do that? Well, it signals that you trust the other person. I can trust you with these things about my heart and my past. And not just that, it creates the potential for powerful healing. Proverbs 28 says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes will obtain mercy. Obtain mercy. Some of you ladies, a guy, when you get close, he will tell you about abuse he suffered as a boy that he never shared with anybody else. Some of you guys, she'll tell you the same thing. Tragic, horrible things done to her. And then all of us are going to talk about the things we did that were wrong, that hurt people, that messed up were mistakes. No one is pure in this place. And we'll have to present these things to that person. Why would we do that? We do it because it signals that we trust them. I can trust you with the delicate things in my heart. And we do it because it has the potential for powerful healing. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them finds mercy. That if you can say to someone, these are the things I did in my past. I'm not proud of them, but God changed me and I've walked away from them. If that person can hear all of that and say, that saddens me, it pains me, but I forgive you and I love you, and I want you. That empathy dissolves so much shame, and to confess and forsake and find mercy is what we want. This person now knows all of me and still wants me. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. That's the other benefit. It creates bonding. When you realize this person knows all of me and can handle that like a treasure, You will hold them close and say nothing in this world gets between me and you. And you will create a tight bond that you are meant to. We want that. And ladies, if you've confessed the deepest things in your heart and that guy can't forgive you, praise God you figured that out before you got married. Because if he won't forgive you for what you did to somebody else, how is he going to forgive you for what you do to him? And guys, it's the same way. As you can share more of yourself, if she can't forgive you for your past, good riddance, because you want someone who's like Jesus. What was Jesus like? He saw us at our worst. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, he came running to us. He knows every dark, broken, sad thing about you, and he is running towards you. He loves you. He was constantly moving towards the sinner so that religious people are like, what are you doing? Why are you going to their parties? Why are you hanging out in their clubs? Why are you doing these things? He said, because I've come for the sick. I don't see their sickness. And go, Ooh. He said, I came for it. He said, I want to love you even at your worst. I want to forgive and cleanse you. What does it say he did to his bride in Ephesians chapter 5? It says that he washes her with the word so she will be without blemish and without spot. He is going to love us and his love makes us more beautiful. That's why we sing. If you wonder, why do Christians sing? Because I got to do something at the top end to get us in the mood to hear a guy talk. That's not what we do. (laughs) You sing to celebrate. What are we celebrating? A God who forgives. A God who knows everything and loves us still. A God who gave everything before we gave him anything back. A God who loved us with abandon. That's what Jesus did on the cross. It was a declaration of love. I am giving all of myself for you. And when someone does that, you want to give all of yourself back. And what we will bring him is dirty and broken and sad, but he will make beauty out of broken things. That's the God we serve. You want someone who will love you like that, that will see you and say, I'm going to forgive one another just as Christ forgave us, is what Colossians will say. You want someone like that. And when you survive that moment, you will say, my beloved is mine and I am his. And then when you confess that deeply, then it just becomes a matter of how fast can we get engaged and get that ring on? Because the closer you feel emotionally, the closer you're gonna wanna get those bodies, right? And that's why they say, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyard the vineyard and our blossoms. The vineyard often is presented as her body or it's often presented as their love. 
And they say, as our love is beginning to grow, they call out to the community, protect us. Protect us from things that would damage us. Protect us from going too fast physically while we're still evaluating are we a match emotionally. Protect us from not communicating well so we hurt each other when we should help each other. They call for the community, and that's the last thing. You want the approval of the community. You want people around you to help you and to see that this is right. You want people to surround you that will promote this unity and say this is a good thing. You want people around you that will extol it. You want them around you to help you evaluate We talked about that last week, that in the Song of Solomon, only four people speak. God, the the lover, the beloved, and her friends. Because there's a principle there. If you want to be her lover, you got to get with her friends, right? (laughs) Because she knows, they know she's infatuated, but they say, rightly do you love him. They help her evaluate. And then they help you catch the foxes. I know for Donna and I, as we were getting to know each other, I was attracted to her physically, but I didn't know if I could trust her with all my heart. We weren't sure, but we were hanging out, and so we would want to do movie night, but I wasn't going to go to her apartment by herself. She lived alone, and I was like, man, I'm not evil. Apartments aren't evil, but you get me in there alone with you, I'm going to get evil. Like, I just can't. Like, ah, like, wait a minute. We're not sure if we're the one, and so let's wait. And so we would go to my apartment because I had a roommate, and we would watch movies together, the three of us on the couch. And it would be me and Donna and Justin was my roommate. And his last name was Case. And so we always had him there, just in case. <laughs> just in case. People think I make that up. I don't. He's a real guy, and he was really there for us. And we loved him. And Donna had some guys. Donna had a big former Navy SEAL that used to pick me up by my arms. <laughs> because he loved Donna. And he said, I don't want a guy to just fool around with her body and play with her heart and not really love her because he loved her. So when I would come into town, he would grab me and pick me up. You say, are you being good to her? Are you taking care of her? I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I am. No, I haven't. Heard. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? And then he would put me down and we would sit together and he would cry talking about the beauty of marriage, that he had had a difficult life, but God forgave him and healed him. He had a marriage where they loved each other like Jesus loved the church. They had something beautiful and he wanted that for us too. And the community surrounded us and they made us better. They made us something we could have never been on our own. So you wanna feel that attraction. Is there excitement? You wanna see, but is it life? Is it making us love God more? You wanna see resolve. I wanna work through the conflict and you wanna see the skill of communication and we're figuring out how to do that. You want to survive confession. You're knowing more of me and I can trust you with my heart. And then you want the community to say, rightly do the maidens love you. This is good. And when you know all that, I remember for me sitting in that library and saying, Ben, are you really ready to cash out on singleness? Do you really trust this girl? And it was an amazing thing for me to evaluate like that and find in the depths of me, yes, yes, she loves me and I love her and she is better and I choose her, and I'm gonna love her till death do us part, and I'm gonna love her like Christ loved the church because I know she loves me the way Jesus loves me, that she forgave me of all that I'd done in the past and all the wrong I'd done for her. She loved me even when my brokenness became painfully and embarrassingly apparent in our courtship. She was gentle with me. We loved each other like Jesus loves you today. And so let's get that relationship right first. Let's get a relationship with God, right? Where you know what it is to be forgiven and loved and cherished by your maker. Let him change you to make you a well of living water. And then let's speak to one another with kindness and let's help each other pair off in the beautiful dance of courtship God created so that we can be a community of healthy marriages and healthy families and a healthy city where we love one another well.